how, how to value businesses or value stocks and what are the metrics and the fundamentals of a business that you need to look for. It's, it's a very gray area in a way. There are obvious fundamentals you need to look at, right? Like the cash flows of that business, like dividend payouts, like the earnings of the business, uh, like the PE ratios of the business, like all these things. There are real tangible things you look at, concrete fundamentals of a business that you look at. But it also depends on what school of investing you subscribe to. If you're in the value investing space, if you're in the growth investing space, if you're in the crypto space, um, it really depends on what school of investing you subscribe to, who you want to follow, who you want to model. Someone like uh, Peter Lynch, for example, I have books behind me here from Peter Lynch. Peter Lynch has one of his most famous books is One Up on Wall Street. He has a couple other books that are really good on fundamentals of business. He was the fund manager and uh, did, did all the investing for uh, what's the fund called? Uh, Magellan, something in Magellan. But Peter Lynch was a very successful investor and he had great returns, is very well known. And then he just... Uh, stepped away from the investing world once he accomplished his targets and his financial goals. He's also a great one, has a couple of great books. So it depends on, there are certain people that, for example, would say any business or any stock for the sake of this, what well, stock is really just a business, any business that is, you know, higher than a PE price to earnings ratio of 10, I don't even look at, I don't even evaluate. I don't even bother with it. It's already, it's too expensive for me. It's out of my range of businesses I like to invest in. I look for businesses that are PEs of one or two or five, right? Price to earning ratios. There are other people that say PE is completely irrelevant or PE ratio is just one aspect. It's a very minimal aspect. I want to look at everything else. I want to look at the moat, the competitive resistance and durability of that business. For example, a company like Colgate, right? It's one of the companies or like a Coca-Cola. It's been there and it was operating and expanding and still selling during wars because people have use for that product. So there's another element there. It's called durability, long-term resistance and durability to markets and to external factors. That's a business, you know, that's a sorry, fundamental assessment. You don't really think about it. It's not tangible. I can't give you a number on a spreadsheet, but it's something you have to figure out and look at the conditions around the business, right? So there's tangible and intangible fundamentals you have to look at with the business, the moat around the business, the competitive moat right? How are they keeping competition out? How are they taking over that entire market space or market share, right? Those are things. Management. How competent is the management? How focused are they on building their business, doing everything to do with their business, moving their business forward, as opposed to trying to impress Wall Street, trying to impress on the quarterly earnings and say, inflate the numbers and do accounting shenanigans and say, oh, we did all this and we did all that. And look at our, you know, Facebook is notorious for doing that, especially more recently about uh, overinflating their, their users and the growth of their users. Although it's, it's been on a de decline, right? Especially in one of the most important demographics, which is younger people, right? So there are metrics like that. And then there are the intangibles to look at the actual management, to look at the moat, to look at the durability. So there, there are many, many factors when it comes to fundamentals to assess and evaluate. I would start with these fundamental books to learn the business side of things not necessarily the intangibles, but the business side. And um, just to give you a little history on this as well, really quick, I hope all you guys are finding this interesting, but if I'm rambling on on this, let me know. Uh, but the reason I'm giving a long-winded answer is because I feel like it's an interesting topic and you guys probably want the full answer. But to just give you the last point on this, value investing and these guys and this whole camp of where they came from, the Benjamin Grahams, the Warren Buffetts, Charlie Munger, Seth Klarmans, all these guys, uh, and then the value investors of nowadays, or just any of the great investors, they call them value investors, but really they do a lot of different things. Um, all of these guys were applying these principles, these fundamentals of the numbers, looking at mispriced businesses that the market is overlooking, right? They're mispriced. There's something called the efficient market theory, which mainly comes out of academics. It comes out of schools, right? Which says all the businesses you see, all the stocks you see, all the prices you see are efficiently priced. The market already takes into consideration everything that's happening. Obviously, that's not real. In my opinion, you'd have to be an idiot to think that, to believe that. Because clearly, we've seen businesses down 90% of their valuation for no reason. The fundamentals haven't changed. We've seen businesses up in major bull markets and in bubbles that we're experiencing even right now, up over 40, 50, 70, 90% of their fair valuation. So obviously, the markets are not efficient. There are, you know, it's human beings. You're dealing with human psychology when you're in the markets. You're dealing with new money, younger generations that are coming into the stocks and marketing and crypto space and all that. You're dealing with 
you know, outside circumstances like the Fed printing $5 trillion over the last year. You're dealing with a COVID flash crash. You're dealing with all kinds of things, right? So the markets are not efficient. You're dealing with not just fundamentals, but personal biases of human beings. So if there's negative sentiment towards a sector, let's say commodities, or towards a certain area of the world, let's say China or Asia, if there's a negative sentiment like there is right now towards China, towards Asia, if there's negative sentiment, if there's negative political tensions that are going on, people sell off, the, the businesses sell off, stock markets crash, there's corrections, there's crashes, but it doesn't mean any of the fundamentals of the business actually changed, right? As an example, Alibaba is a massive business with massive national and international arms, with a massive cloud business that's not even evaluated into the projections of the business right now, but they're building a massive cloud presence. They're expanding and building a massive facility in uh, Netherlands for their shipments and for their warehouses and whatnot. A lot of the other Chinese mega companies within the country go through the Alibaba systems. They have the Baba Pay and the FinTech and all that stuff as well. They're constantly expanding and whatnot. But right now, or over the last six months, or the last year, really, the sentiment towards China has been extremely negative. There has been this whole thing more recently around um, China's real estate and the Evergrande crisis and all kinds of things happening there. So for all these negative sentiment reasons, Alibaba, Tencent, and a couple of these other ones, Baidu and Pinduoduo and a couple of the other stocks in, in China are down 50%, more than 50% at times from their all-time highs, right? So that's markets not being efficient. That's my point. I wanted to give you guys an example. So that's the efficient market theory. And then the other school of thought, which is all the greatest investors of all time. So I'm going to side with this side of the table here with this school of thought, which is markets are not efficient. Markets are extremely inefficient. There's always bargains to be found. There's always opportunities to be found. There's always businesses that are mispriced if you look for them, right? There's always sectors that are mispriced. So one thing a lot of great investors do is they look at a business, they do their evaluations, they, do, they look at the fundamentals, they have a theory around that business and where it's going to be in three, five, seven, 10 years. And then you build a position in that business, depending again on your portfolio allocation and how you want to do it. You build a position in the business and you wait for your theory to come to fruition, meaning you wait for the markets to catch up to your theory. When that happens, your theory gets priced in. What that means is everybody will pile on because everybody's aware of it now. And then the, the stock follows the business. The stock, that's another fundamental for you to know. Stock price always follows the business. Stock price always follows the earnings of the business. So what happens is the stock rallies and goes up and whatever. And then when everybody else piles in is usually when you sell, unless it's a long-term hold and it's a whole different story. But when you have a theory in place and your theory comes to fruition everybody, and the market catches up with your theory, that's when you get out.